Hello, everyone. A very warm welcome to all of you. Hi, I am Aruhi Tyagi, Associate Dean here at AAFT Online. And I, on behalf of the entire AAFT Online family, welcome you all to this webinar on how to integrate telemedicine in hospital management. And what could be more exciting than to have with us today Dr. Vijay De Silva. Well, he is an esteemed consultant physician and the director of critical care at the Asian Heart Institute, Mumbai. With three decades of experience in emergency medicine and critical care, Dr. De Silva is recognized as a pioneer in managing complex and critical patients. In addition to his clinical practice, Dr. De Silva serves as a dedicated teacher, guide and examiner for postgraduate students, imparting his knowledge and mentoring the next generation of doctors and is frequently invited as faculty for national and international events. Dr. De Silva has held the position of medical director of the Standard Chartered Mumbai Marathon from 2004 to 2017. And currently he serves as the medical director of the Tata Mumbai Marathon from 2018 onwards. These roles demonstrate his con commitment and contribution to the sports medicine and his involvement in promoting health and wellness in the community. It's an absolute honor to have you here with us, uh, sir, today. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for an elaborate and uh, exhaustive introduction. Thank you so much. Also, sir, uh, I would like to, uh, you know, present to you this award on behalf of the uh, International Chamber of Media and Entertainment Industry. And we are honored to present you the award for excellence for your outstanding contribution to the healthcare sector. So please accept this award, sir. Yes, I accept. Thank you so much. I'm honored. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Also, uh, we have with us, uh, you know, Dr. Kirti also. Uh, she is the program leader for Diploma in Healthcare Management at AAFT. And she brings over 11 years of diverse healthcare experience with us, uh, with her. She has a comprehensive understanding of healthcare operations from managing private clinics to leading specialized departments at Escorts Hospital and later serving as the head of patient experience at Fortis Hospital, Delhi. So with expertise in public health administration, she is committed to optimizing patient care and organizational efficiency. And we are uh, also thrilled to have you here with us, Dr. Geetri. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Silva. Yes, welcome, welcome. Thank you, everyone. Okay, so let's get started. Uh, thank you for all of you to join us today. You took out your time and you are here with us. Uh, so, Dr. De Silva, all over to you. We are uh, waiting to hear uh, from you. Yes, uh, good morning, everybody. I hope all of you can hear me. Uh, Yes, sir, you're audible, uh, today's yeah. topic for us to discuss is telemedicine. Now, in a very simple one-line definition, if you look at telemedicine, it is delivery of healthcare with the use of information and communication technology. It's a very simple and one-line definition. If you look at the tele telemedicine, it was uh, it came into being in somewhere in mid uh, 20th century. But the big boom for telemedicine came only during COVID-19 pandemic. The reason was twofold. One was lockdown. Lockdown made it difficult and dangerous to approach hospital. But it was a necessity. So on one side, you were stopped from going to hospital, but you needed it. So what to do? The help came from an unlikely quarter. That is the technology, the communication technology and the information technology has developed to such a great extent that it immediately adapted. It was adapted by the hospitals, the doctors to use to communicate and provide healthcare delivery to the patients. So post pandemic, it came into use, massively used and it has 
developed into a large scale business model also now so that all the hospitals and the healthcare industry they are adopting uh, telemedicine as one of their uh, business verticals next slide next slide now if you uh, look at uh, my journey my journey started somewhere in 80s there are two uh, pathways i'll tell you one is the communication pathway and second is the hospitals uh, pathway if you look at in 80s the only way to communicate was landlines 70s and 80s and then what you had you had development of cordless phones which were a novelty at that time who oh, cordless phone and uh, after that the pagers came in then the blackberry platform came into existence the email was already there in picture but it was not that widely used after that the android phones came the smartphone came and now you have phones which has everything which has communication it has video it has audio it has text it has mail everything everything that can be looked at as communication technology information technology everything is there in your hand in one small box now this is something amazing this is what has made it possible for telemedicine to succeed adding to it the ai the development of ai which is there it is also going to revolutionize it further next slide please now if you look at telemedicine it has made two big differences one is access to care telemedicine has made it possible for healthcare to be available at remote areas rural areas to be available at people's home who are home bound who are not able to move out of their home who can't travel or they don't want to travel for all these people it's a boom because it not only saves the time it also save the cost cost to the hospital as well as to the patient if the patient has to travel the expenditure is saved if the patient is from outstation his travel expenditure and lodging boarding everything is saved because if patients who are coming as medical tourist they spend a large amount of uh, uh, their purse in the non medical part of it and the medical part may be less so telemedicine has made it possible that the expenditure is less time is saved and the accessibility is very easy and uh, as with the booming technology things are getting better and better and with the ai coming in analytics are better and the ready made the data uh, analysis is there the doctors are getting it easy to take decisions and provide uh, uh, tailor made care to the patients next slide next slide please yeah now the basic application if you look at telemedicine you have video consultation now this video consultation can be the first consultation where the patient is meeting the doctor for the first time a first consultation where uh, the basic uh, uh, foundation is laid for the doctor patient relationship and then there is a follow up consultation now in this follow up consultation the doctor reviews the progress of the patient reviews the uh, investigation which he has advised and also fine tunes the medication which has been given based on his progress and based on his medication so you have a first consultation and then you have a follow up consultation now the addition of the remote monitoring has again made a huge difference in the telemedicine field if you look at the remote monitoring which is available particularly wearable monitoring these are biosensor based monitoring you can monitor almost everything remotely the patient may be at home you can monitor his blood pressure his pulse rate heart rate oxygen saturation his temperature his weight uh, sugar can be monitored with a continuous glucose monitoring which is again conveyed to the doctor uh, weight management then sleep tracking can be done fitness tracking can be done and uh, more so nowadays you also have handheld devices uh, strip devices available which can also monitor the anticoagulation drug effect now patients who are on blood thinners uh, who have wall replacement or other form of treatment where they need a blood thinner now monitoring is a cumbersome thing that they have to sometime monitor twice a week 
thrice a week or once a week and they have to go to the lab to get uh, give blood collect report get back to doctor now this is all made easy the patient can himself do a, with a pin prick like a blood sugar monitoring he can do anticoagulation testing it is transmitted to the doctor via bluetooth uh, and the doctor gets the report and he can immediately advise so the whole uh, uh, trouble of going to the lab getting the report conveying it to the doctor getting your treatment back has been made it in minutes so remote monitoring has made it almost possible for everything the vital data and the investigation to be monitored at a remote place and it is conveyed via bluetooth and internet to the doctor so that remote monitoring is uh, almost like a pillar for the telemedicine now in addition to that once the consultation and all that is done uh digital prescription the electronic prescription is again another convenience which the patient does not have to come to the doctor and nobody has to come to the doctor to collect a prescription law has permitted the doctors to give a digital prescription which is valid only thing there are some limitations which will come to later on another application for the uh, telemedicine is that patient education and counseling again can be done uh, via telemedicine where the patient's time and energy everything is saved so these are all the basic applications uh, in relation to the patient and the uh, this thing uh, another thing is that what the uh, video consultation is done this can happen on forefront forefront is first is that it can be between the patient and the doctor that is the most common thing that is happening second is it can be between the caregiver and the doctor third it can be between a healthcare provider who is with the patient and the doctor so patient to doctor caregiver to doctor healthcare provider to doctor and the last is between doctor to doctor that most frequently happens between the diagnostic department particularly like radiology and the pathology and other diagnostic department and uh, between the person who has referred the patient to that lab so the doctor to doctor consultation again Uh, a proper uh, decision making is based on the uh, input given by the uh, diagnostic department so these are the four type of uh, consultation that can happen next slide now building the successful telemedicine practice so what what we need to do is basically uh, the healthcare provider hospitals particularly they are maintaining a separate department as telemedicine department there you have a dedicated doctors medical staff assistants and clerical staff available so the basic thing is the patient contacts this particular department or the number which is given for appointment now the when the patient asks for appointment it's not that they call for appointment and everything happens on the front there is a lot of background work which needs to be done before actual consultation can happen so what the necessary things are the supporting staff one is they get proper data from the patient first is they need to verify that there is a proper id proof of the patient because there can be impersonation and uh, that has to be avoided a proper id proof of the patient has to be there first second thing is a proper consent has to be taken now this consent is not uh, one line consent or something like that uh, it has an elaborate uh, telemedicine consent consent which has got lot of specific clauses related to the safety of both the patient and the doctor uh, if you uh, need i, I is there on my website a proper telemedicine consent is there uh, people can download it from there and use it also it's a very uh, proper and legally verified uh, telemedicine consent second thing is you need to have a checklist a medical checklist of yes no type of thing which which enumerates it is given to the patient and the patient ticks it whether he has diabetes yes no the blood pressure similarly very common conditions eight to 10 conditions are listed in addition to that uh, if any surgeries the patient has undergone any procedures he has undergone whether he has any allergies all those vital data which need not be uh, asked to the patient during consultation so this data can be collected beforehand this checklist also is there on my website people can take it uh, it is uh, uh, labeled as personal information pro forma uh, so patient's id 
consent and the personal information pro forma. These three basic things are collected. In addition to that, the patient is told to give a brief medical history of his own on his own writing, or he can also submit the previous discharge papers from previous hospitals or whatever discharge papers if he was admitted somewhere. Uh, what you need to know is his current medications, his current reports, and also after the, all this data is collected, the patient can be given appropriate date and a time to consult with the doctor. So this basic data collection is very mandatory for a successful teleconsultation because to get all this data while doing a teleconsultation will take a lot of time and uh, the patient may not be able to give it to you also. So uh, beforehand, all this data needs to be collected. At the same time, uh, the billing formalities, all that can be done at this stage. And then the supporting staff, they give the uh, uh, this uh, appointment to the patient. Next slide. You can go to the next slide. Yes. Yeah. Now, once this basic background work has been done and the time and date has been fixed for the doctor, the consultation, actual consultation, I'll tell in few brief minutes. One is the doctor first introduce, has to mandatorily introduce himself along with his credentials and qualifications so that the patient knows whom is he uh, uh, taking consultation from. Then the doctor has to verify the patient's name and ID so that uh, a wrong patient should not, a wrong person should not be taken as patient. Next, the uh, uh, from the basic data which the doctor has got it, uh, a communication between the patient and the doctor or the care gear or the healthcare worker on the other side can happen. Uh, actual problem of the patient can be understood and the doctor can form a conclusion based on whatever data he has and his talk with the patient and also the examination, the uh, inspection which he can do. The limitation is there on the teleconsultation that the physical examination part is a little limited, limited but again, it can be... Uh, uh, the inspection part itself is quite uh, informative and helpful. So at the end of it, the doctor has an impression of what the patient's problem is, what needs to be done, what medication he'll need, and what investigation he'll need. So all this advice, he can give it in the form of an electronic prescription to the patient. And also a follow-up advice when to come back and with what uh, repeat investigation and a future date can be fixed up for a follow-up consultation. Next slide. Now, uh, if you look at the utility of uh, telemedicine in a hospital uh, scenario, hospital management scenario, so twofold you can take it. One is uh, for the staff and second is for the patient. Now, as far as the staff is concerned, uh, online training is a very well-established thing. Uh, training, performance evaluation, and uh, uh, reassessment of the staff so that their uh, knowledge and their techniques and uh, their skills keep on improving. So online uh, training of the staff, their evaluation is one uh, front. Second thing, as, as far as we were discussing the patient's front, now the patient can have consultation with the doctor, follow-up consultation. They can also uh, attend uh, medical uh, briefing sessions, medical education for the patient, counseling, and the remote monitoring. The remote monitoring also is a part of the whole scenario where the doctor can advise the patient what type of monitoring he needs, also advise what type of variables are needed for that and how to use it and how to communicate back the data to the doctor. So consultation, monitoring, follow-up, education, counseling, all these are for the patient. Now, as far as hospitals are concerned, the hospitals can uh, collaborate with uh, other universities or uh, institutes uh, in the other city or abroad for improvement in uh, skill and training and uh, sharing knowledge and expertise. That is uh, all that uh, can happen in uh, telemedicine as far as hospitals happen. Next slide, please. Now, the challenges in telemedicine. If you look at uh, technology matters, now, as with any technology, sometimes failure can happen. There can be loss of internet connection. There may be malfunction of the hardware. So those things, technology malfunction can occur. 
Second thing is there is a little, little bit of digital divide everywhere, all over the world, between the availability of the hardware and the internet and the usability of it. So there may be some areas where the uh, facility for internet may not be available. So the, the digital divide comes in there. So the basic thing for telemedicine is that uh, internet connectivity has to be there. Then you have some challenges with elderly people who may not be able to use the technology. Uh, another group of people are there who are with disabilities. There again, you may not be able to effectively perform telemedicine on, with their, on their own, but they, they can need help and uh, go for it. So technology failure, digital divide, uh, elderly people and people with disabilities, they have some challenges for using telemedicine. Now, as far as licensing and regulation is concerned, uh, MCI, when the MCI was there, now we have a National Medical Commission. MCI has approved and uh, implemented uh, telemedicine practice guideline in 2020. Now, that, that is a quite a comprehensive do document and uh, it uh, enlists how to go about, what to do, what not to do. And uh, that is the basic document uh, which uh, guides the telemedicine practice in India. So it's available with the NMC and subsequently NMC is uh, also amending it uh, periodically and uh, you have a good uh, guideline. Though it's not a law, but it is binding on all the medicals. Uh, telemedicine practice guideline by uh, National Medical Commission. Now, coming to privacy and security uh, aspect, as with any, any form of medical practice, the basic ethics have to be followed in telemedicine also. The ethics of medical practice, which uh, is there in hospital, has to be equally if applicable for uh, telemedicine also. Next is that the uh, patient's privacy and uh, confidentiality, again, has to be strictly maintained. Uh, next is the data protection. Whatever the data patient has provided you, personal data, uh, medical data, and which you are storing, you are bound to, by legally you are bound to, keep that data stored with you and also safe so that uh, there is no break in in that. So patient's confidentiality, privacy, data protection, following all the medical ethics, very important for all the people who are practicing telemedicine. Now coming to the quality of care. Now quality of care, basically, if you look at uh, uh, the consent itself says, when you take a consent, there is that the telemedicine may not be as effective as an in-person consultation and treatment. And this limitation has to be understood by the patient and the doctor both. Uh, so that limitation is there, though it is quite an effective and uh, uh, workable way of getting medical care. Uh, there are some other small uh, negatives about teleconsultation. One is that the traditional doctoring uh, equipment which the, the patient relation between the doctor and the patient comes in when they meet personally, that part may not be uh, there, it may be missing. Next is uh, the physical examination, as I said, is limited. Uh, you have to deal with whatever data you get, whatever reports you get, and whatever the patient tells you when you're talking to him, and also what you're inspecting. So uh, further physical examination part is a limitation. Uh, another negative is that in case the data fed to you, particularly the uh, data which you have got or the data which you are getting from the remote patient monitoring is wrong, your treatment can be wrong. So your treatment is entirely dependent on that data. So that is another negative. Uh, your data has to be very accurate for a treatment guideline to be made as per uh, the patient uh, problem. And the last, last hitch is uh, the Food and Drug Administration, they have divided the drugs into various categories. Now, as far as uh, uh, telemedicine is concerned, the list O drug, list A drug and list B drug, they can be freely prescribed. But the Schedule X drugs and the narcotics and psychotropic drugs, these are strictly prohibited to be prescribed on the telemedicine platform. Now, that puts a limitation to the mental health part of it, though for the mental health, it's a very good modality of uh, uh, meeting patient, counseling patient and uh, treating them. The limitation comes in that you can't uh, prescribe psychotropic uh, medicines there. 
And similarly, narcotics are not there. Schedule X drugs you can't prescribe. It will be illegal on the part of the doctor to do that. So these are the limitations for the telemedicine part of that. Next slide, please. Now, future, uh, basically, see, if you look at uh, uh, telemedicine has uh, changed the in-person care at the hospital and brought quite a lot of it to the in-person care at home based on remote monitoring and uh, uh, artificial intelligence, the data analysis, the analytics are good. And uh, there's a huge future for uh, AI in uh, telemedicine. The next part is that uh, uh, long-term patient care. If you look at uh, chronic illnesses, chronic illnesses like uh, diabetes, heart failure, rheumatic problems, uh, dermatological problems, these have a very good scope in telemedicine because the patient need not keep on coming to the doctor each and every time. The chronic illnesses definitely can be managed in a long-term basis by a doctor uh, on telemedicine. So telemedicine has got a good future with the information uh, technology, communication technology almost coming to a peak and now the AI coming in, uh, there is a huge scope for telemedicine to develop further. And particularly, uh, if you look at the longevity of people is increasing, the chronic health problems are increasing. And uh, also the traveling and commuting to hospitals and meeting doctors is getting difficult in urban areas because of the traffic congestions. So there's a good, huge scope for telemedicine to develop further. And uh, let's hope that we are all a part of that journey and do a good job on that front. Thank you. You can go to the next slide. Okay, so to all the learners, if you have any questions uh, related to whatever Dr. De Silva just spoke, you can put them in the Q&A box, which is located right below in your, on your screens, next to the chat box. And in case you're not able to find, then please put them in the chat box. We will be taking them up. Uh, thank you, Dr. De Silva, for uh, such an informative session, which you took. Yeah, so, I hope it was helpful to everybody who was listening in. <laughs> and absolutely. if anybody has further suggestions, addition to whatever I said, I'm open to hear that. <laughs> yes, yes, sir. I think we have a few questions which have been coming. Yes. So I'll uh, just ask them on the behalf of uh, the learners to you. Um, uh, so Mohammed Naveen is asking that, uh, are there any laws which are uh, regarding some telemedicine resource material? I think he wants to ask certain laws which are related to telemedicine when you're using it. Are there any laws? No, no. See, the one is the uh, uh, telemedicine practice guideline is there by the uh, medical body, which is a, uh, you can say that it's from the government. The government has made uh, telemedicine practice guideline, which enlists all the pros, cons and how to go about and what not to do, what to do, what can be done. Everything is there in that. Now, I think uh, Mr. Mohammed's question is re related with uh, uh, monitoring, monitoring device. Mm -hmm. Think, right? So, sir, he is he is asked that laws and regulation resource material. I think he wants to know from where can he get the knowledge about what are the laws and regulations related to telemedicine. It's available on the uh, internet, uh, okay. telemedicine practice guideline, or you can go to the National Medical Commission website. You will get it from there. Right. I think it's also in the appendix six of the MCI uh, uh, rules regulation. Uh, Fine, sir. Thank you for, uh, you know, answering that. Uh, Venkata uh, uh, is asking that for the online prescription, are there any guidelines to be followed? Because I think he has a startup developing remote monitoring technology using yeah. a device and cloud medicine platform. Yeah, and you see the practice guideline clearly mentions how the prescription should be. It is a definite format there for the prescription that the patient's ID and uh, his age, sex, and the demograph uh, of the patient has to come in that. The prescription, as I said, limitation is there that only list O, list A, and list B drugs can be prescribed. Uh, narcotics and psychotropics can't be prescribed. Uh, and uh, similarly, uh, Schedule X drugs can't be prescribed. Then the, uh, uh, the prescription should have a doctor's signature 
along with his registration number. Now, uh, as far as the MCI, the National Medical Commission is concerned, only those doctors who are registered with the either the state medical uh, register or with the national medical register, they can practice uh, telemedicine. So they have very clearly defined who can do it and uh, how it can be done. And also the prescription, the prescription format also is there in that. And if you want, uh, uh, I can share my prescription format, which uh, if you people need, I can send it to you. Yeah, thank you so much for that, sir. We would be happy to share that with the learner. Thank you. Uh, so Prashant is also asking a question related to the medical uh, legal issues. He's asking that what are the medical uh, medical legal issues in telemedicine for patients consulting outside India? Uh, no, patients, as far as the NMC is concerned, we are not authorized to uh, give medical advice to uh, people uh, outside the country. Though people are doing it, but uh, it can uh, get tricky in the sense ki that in case something goes wrong, uh, the doctor will be liable. Maybe the, that person can maybe file a case in his country, but he will not be able to file a case in this country. And it will be a big controversy there. So as of now, they say ki that you should not uh, do a teleconsult to a, a person who is outside India. Inside India, yes, legally you're right. Yeah, thank you so much for answering that also, sir. Uh, also, then we have a few more questions here. And this is by uh, Shruti. And she's asking that what are the techniques for... Uh, what are the techniques to... Sorry, just... Yeah, what are the techniques to heal, heal the patient through telemedicine? Techniques, is she asking the modalities of teleconsultation? I think so, yes. Sir. Uh, basically, see, you have uh, video consultation, you have audio consultation, you have text consultation. Uh, text consultation, basically the email and the fax. Fax is hardly used now, but email is one version where people mail you the whole thing and they want consultation on mail also. So email is one uh, aspect of it. Second, uh, the most common aspect is the video video consultation. Now, video consultation is available through, there are various commercial apps we are available who facilitate it for you. And, uh, but again, uh, free freehold messenger services, something like WhatsApp and uh, FaceTime on the iPhone. And uh, there are so many uh, free, free uh, messaging devices which can be used uh, for uh, teleconsultation. All right, thank you so much, sir. So, uh, you know, we have been having certain questions related to where the courses and where, you know, we can learn more about telemedicine. So I would just want to uh, elaborate here to all of you that uh, we at AAFT online, we have a diploma program in hospital management. And, uh, you know, you all can um, learn this at your own pace. It's an online program. So, you know, you can learn it wherever, whenever you have time and wherever you are on the go as well. If you want to know more about the diploma program, you can, you know, uh, call us uh, on these numbers or you can also email us and we would be happy to reach you out. So in case you have any queries related to the course, and of course, we do cover telemedicine in it as well. Okay, uh, sorry for that uh, short uh, thing, uh, Dr. De Silva. Um, I'm happy coming, to coming back to the questions. Uh, so, uh, you know, we have many questions pouring in. Uh, Dr. Shivam is asking that what AI apps or technologies can be applied for emergency care of patients in the ER, especially in overcrowded uh, setups like Mumbai hospitals? And what steps can be taken using the AI to increase the speedy turnaround time for patient care? Uh, this is in not relation with the telemedicine, right? Yes, sir. Okay. Now, see, if, as far as telemedicine is concerned, uh, emergency care is not uh, allowed and not permitted. Basically, in an emergency, like the patient has come to and you realize that it's an emergency, you better need to send the patient to the nearest healthcare facility, guide them. Maybe you can guide them on the first aid also and counsel them so that uh, you don't uh, treat an emergency patient online. 
Now, as far as uh, AI is concerned in the emergency rooms, now in emergency rooms, uh, uh, it may not be of uh, much use in a casualty, casualty or a, a, a triage area. In the triage area, there, what you have is you have a real time data in front of the doctor and the doctor has to act on it. So you don't have time for any analytics. The analytics come in if you are uh, having a tele monitoring of your ICU. Now, see, if you look at uh, when we started our career, there was the only two departments which were using uh, technology. One was the radiology and second was pathology. The rest, everything was one-to-one. Uh, -one. Uh, there was not much of a technology interface between the patient and the doctor. Now, gradually, as time went by, the uh, temperature, pressure, monitoring, uh, all those came in. And they fine-tuned it to such an extent that serious patients were put in a segregation and the monitors, monitors came into being, monitoring the heart rate, invasive pressure monitoring, and all those things. So the monitoring initially started in the wards and then fine-tuned, came into an ICU monitoring. Now, this ICU monitoring, uh, to a great extent, till now also at some places, it's happening that you have a bedside monitor and then this is connected to a central monitor in the unit and there's somebody monitoring from the central station. Now, with the coming in of uh, uh, information technology, communication getting better, you have now facilities that, like, if I want to see any of my patient being monitored, I don't need to go there. I can do it from anywhere where I am on my mobile itself. Uh, the bedside monitors are connected to the central monitors. They are connected through internet to the authorized people who can view it. Like if I want, I can view the central monitor of my place. I can view the center, bedside monitor of the patient. I can view the other devices, what they're doing, and also give instruction uh, on my own, in, despite if nobody's calling me and informing me, if I view something going wrong or something needs to be intervened, I can do that. So uh, remote monitoring is one aspect of it that you have a monitoring at the site you have somebody remotely monitoring it. Now, as far as AI is concerned in this, you don't have to do much because the monitors and the, these things are they themselves equipped so much to analyze the data. Everything is uh, put into a slots where uh, upper and lower limits are put. If anything going out of that range, there's always a audible and visible alarm. And uh, so that itself, you can say, is a part of AI. The machine is told that I want my patient's heart rate to be between 60 to 100. If it goes below 60, you let me know. Above, goes above. So for all the vital parameters, for the blood pressure, for the CVP, for the pulmonary artery pressure, for oxygenation, for his blood sugar level, like you can set the parameters. Sugar goes below that, I need to know. And uh, there is no ma manual interface. The uh, digital device itself communicates to the via Bluetooth to the provider and the alarm is at the alarm end. So that you can say is an artificial intelligence, which now analyzing a massive amount of data to provide trends and take decision based on that uh, will not be very useful in a critical care because there each individual patient needs a different type of treatment and uh, care. So analysis of individual data, yes, which is already happening. So AI may not have much of a role there. Thank you, sir. Thank you for such a, uh, you know, great explanation which you gave. Um, so we have a, a question wherein, uh, you know, the patient is, uh, sorry, uh, the learner Sanjay is asking that if you can suggest a software which is available in the market, which can be used for telemedicine. You don't need a software for that. You can make your own, like say, if you uh, go to my website, what I have designed, uh, my patient's consent. Consent is there. There's a PIP, personal information pro forma. You can design it yourself and uh, you can implement it as a software uh, and make it your own. Means there's no ready-made digital, uh, this thing, but what the apps are there, the health apps, which are there used for telemedicine, each company has uh, themselves devised their uh, format, like what data they want from the patient, how they want it, how they compile it. So uh, there is no ready-made platform, but you can decide this very simple. Yeah. Okay. And Sayyid has another question, uh, sir. And he is asking that uh, what is the age of the patient which can be given the telemedicine consultation? Above is there 18. an age limit? Above, above 18. Above 18. 
below 18 no because uh, they don't have a uh, validity to give consent uh, so it's best is to do it only for patients above 18 year of age which the law also says that you should treat only patients who are 18 year and above on telemedicine well, thank you for enlightening that sir uh, Bala Chandran is asking that does telemedicine or tele ICU services are they covered in insurance? Any idea? See, tele ICU basically uh, it will not uh, be billed as an individual part of the bill, right? So if a patient is admitted, see if somebody has uh, see there's a unit now a unit will have say monitors, ventilators, whatever equipment standard equipment ICU will have will have. Now, to make it more uh, better, more uh, savvy as far as technology is concerned, uh, companies have the uh, program and the hardware and the software available uh, to convert into a ICU unit into a, can be remotely monitored. Now, there are softwares available, they are costly each, each like if you want to make a, a remote ICU monitoring for an ICU, uh, roughly, the cost will be something like uh, uh, one to two crore rupees for about 10 bedded ICU. So they install everything. So what they have is they connect, the patient is connected to the monitor or a ventilator or a syringe pump. All this data which is going in is collaborated by them and they collate that whole data. Like they automatically give you what is going through the syringe pump into the patient, how many ML has gone, what medicine is gone, uh, how much has uh, uh, patient's IV gone in, uh, how much has his urine output also is automatically calculated in the sense that the catheters are connected to the devices which men measure how much urine has come into the urine bag. So all that data is collated except for maybe ki what the patient is eating, if he's an eating patient, rest everything can be uh, documented digitally and can be available in a, a digital format to the user end user. But right. is, you know, these these things are uh, expensive in the sense ki that people are using it and uh, it's available. But uh, individual billing will not happen. See the ICU which is digitized like this, they will put that cost into the per bed charge. So uh, ICU bed which is say costing ten thousand rupees per day. A digitized ICU may be charging you 15,000 rupees per day. So as far as the insurance part is concerned, it will depend on the type of insurance and the amount of insurance which that patient has. That will decide whether it will be covered or not because they will not get into the nitty gritty of key or what you are doing separately in that costing. They will look at as they have a category of bed charges. So if your insurance is say 10 lakh, you're eligible for so and so bed class. Uh, your insurance is only 2 lakh, you are eligible for so-and-so bed class. So, so individual billing for the technology will not be done. Absolutely. I get the point, sir. Okay. Uh, uh, Rupsa is asking that how can telemedicine effectively address the ethical concerns of patient privacy and data security while providing equitable healthcare, especially in the underserved and rural areas? Yeah, and you see, as far as uh, confidentiality and privacy is concerned, it is same for everybody, whether it's uh, urban area, rural area, poor, rich, anybody. So the basic medical ethics, which is there between a doctor and a patient, like if the patient comes and tells me that his problems, whatever is there, I examine I come to know things about him. I come to know his physical part, his uh, personal uh, part, whatever. Now, this always has to be between the patient and the doctor only. This can't be shared between and to any third party. Now, whatever this data is there, it also stored wherever they have to maintain that this is stored in a safe place, which is not accessible to unauthorized people. Uh, as far as digital part is concerned, uh, data security, that is why special consents are needed for telemedicine because as far as you are concerned, the patient's reports, his images, his photos, or his data, his personal data, everything is coming to you digitally there is always a chance that there can be mishap, there can be digital failure, or there can be hackers who can get the data out. So all these things have to be in the part of the consent that we are doing it safely for you. We are going to keep it safe. It is going to be private. It is going to be confidential. But at the same time, internet is not safe. Anything can happen. So understand that the patient has to consent that, okay, he agrees to it. And also in the consent, there is clauses which says 
that it is the onus of the provider to keep everything confidential. He can't be, in fact, uh, the clauses also say that in case uh, the doctor has an assistant, the assistant has to also sign for confidentiality. All his staff has to sign for confidentiality. So the patient confidentiality has to be protected at all costs, but it is a little uh, more open to uh, damage in the digital format than in the actual pers in-person format. Right, sir. Thank you so much, sir, for... I think this was an eye-opener for uh, many people here. Uh, Shruti is asking that, can telemedicine services be used to treat psychological issues? Yes, yes. It can be. Only the limitation comes in prescription the drugs. Uh, as far as counseling is concerned, say, uh, uh, a large part of the mental health treatment is counseling, a large part. So that definitely that can be done. In fact, what happens is that these patients who need counseling, they avoid going to a counselor. They don't want to go to anybody. They don't want to talk to anybody. Now, in case you provide them with privacy at their home and somebody talking to them in privacy, yes, they, they are open to it. And I think uh, counseling works better uh, on the telemedicine format than in the person format. Because the patients are reluctant to go and talk to a counselor. Yes. But the limitation comes in prescribing drugs. The psychotropic drugs can't be prescribed. Particularly if you remember uh, <clears throat> Shushan Singh Rajput's case, where he was uh, prescribed uh, antidepressant uh, and anxiety medicines online. Mm. The doctor was definitely uh, reprimanded and pulled up for that. Though he has done it in good uh, faith to treat him, and that again was during the COVID pandemic. But I guess, sir, these medications are not available over the counter until and unless we have the prescription of no, the doctor. Little prescription doctor can give, write and give, no? See, if I'm prescribing medicine to a patient, if I have to, say, give an anti anxiety lonazep, lonazep I want to prescribe, I'll write lonazep to be given this, this, this. Now, that digital prescription is honored by the uh, pharmacist. They give. Right. But the law says that the doctor should not prescribe uh, psychotropic and narcotic medicines on the digital prescription. Oh, but those okay. people are doing it. Yeah. Absolutely. And um, Saeed uh, again has a question. It's not a question. I think he wants your opinion. He's saying that in Telangana, he's heard from his seniors that, you know, you're, you're unable to give prescription of the medicine and message like WhatsApp and all. Uh, and in telemedicine, if we advise any kind of medication uh, on WhatsApp, is it is it okay? Do we come under the roof? No, of no, no. Guidance? I, what, what I got what he's trying to say. See, there are two things. One is like a patient comes to me and consultation is done, telemedicine, whatever. So I have a format of it, a prescription format, which I write patient data, this, that, my signature, my uh, registration number, everything uh, is there. Medicine is there, dosage is there, everything is there. Now, this thing, basically, when you give a digital prescription, we take a photo of that and we send it electronically to the patient. So this is what normally happens in telemedicine. What he's saying is that if like a patient gets back to me on the WhatsApp, key, doctor, this, 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 can you give me a medicine? And I write on the WhatsApp answer itself, he please give tablet loan as a yeah. on that. Now, if he goes with that WhatsApp message to the pharmacy, he will not give. He's right. He'll not give. Because it's not a prescription. So prescribing on a text message or prescribing in a text, like even on the email, if I prescribe, ki, give this medicine, that's not a format of prescription. A pharmacist will never honor it. So if I give a medicine on uh, WhatsApp or a message or on the mail or on any text format to anybody other than the prescription, will not be honored. But the same thing which I give on my prescription and the picture of that is given to him on the WhatsApp, the pharmacist will honor that. If a picture of my prescription, I give it on the mail, which we normally do, it is honored. He takes a printout of that and goes to the pharmacy, they give it. But if I write the name of the medicine as on the WhatsApp answer, so it's not a prescription, they'll now not, not give it. So the pharmacist in that, he said Telangana, right? Yes, so, sir. yes. So the pharmacist in that areas are at least ethical and uh, proper. <laughs> <laughs> that seems to be promising then <laughs> okay 
So, uh, Venkat is asking that for patients below 18, can the parents give the consent on their behalf and get the consultation done? Yes, that, that is a possibility. See, if I, I said that uh, there are four types of consultation, video consultation, patient to the doctor, caregiver to the doctor, and uh, healthcare worker to a doctor. Now, as far as patient in the under 18, the first one is out. The second one is the caregiver. And third one is the health care worker. Now, caregiver can be parents. Parents can be caregiver. Yes, they can get in touch with the doctor and also take advice. But legally, it is not permitted. Telemedicine for pediatric population. Pediatric now, you will not say that 18-year-old is pediatric, is 17-year-old. But law says that an adult only should be done. Below that, should not be done. But people are doing it. It's not very right to do it also. Yeah, parents get in touch sometime to ask medicine. This particularly happens if uh, they are a regular patient of some particular doctor and the doctor knows the child, Yes. parents, and then they are able to. Like a random person calling a pediatrician for an uh, advice on a five-year-old child, this has happened to uh, Not an ideal situation to do it without examining the child. Yes, yes, absolutely correct, sir. Okay, um... Lal Hazel is saying that I am working on a standalone telemedicine unit in my hometown, which is a remote area in northeast uh, India. Uh, what are the basic registrations or approvals and forms? Uh, and from who and where do I uh, take these approvals? No, see, the only thing you need to practice is that you need to be a registered doctor. Uh, if you are registered with the state the medical register, you can practice. You don't need any other permission for that. Now, uh, he says he has got a standalone uh, unit. See, telemedicine does, uh, does not need a licensing to practice. The only licensing to practice is your registration. Now, if you're opening a clinic, say if you're opening a clinic at somewhere, you need the permission of the local municipality for that. It means you need to register with that as a healthcare facility, as a consulting room or anything. But for a telemedicine, you don't need to register. Okay, thank you, sir. Uh, also, uh, there are many questions uh, regarding uh, what is your social media handles wherein, you know, people can follow you or... Uh... I'm not on Instagram. <laughs> you can get in touch with me either on the WhatsApp or mail. Uh, also, uh, sir has uh, his own website, uh, www.drdusilva.com, if I'm not wrong, sir. That's correct, correct. Yeah, so you can reach him out uh, there as well. Any of your student has any queries in relation with telemedicine, they can revert to me, I'll answer them back. Yes, yes. So I think there are two, three questions, how they can reach you, how they can, uh, so you know, you can contact him contact through his website. Them. And tell them that the uh, best way to communicate is either a mail or a WhatsApp message rather than calling. Yes, you yes. Call so some able to answer all the calls. So they a lot of them go in missed calls. And if I don't know the number, I don't call back. <laughs> the best thing is I to message you. so that I know, okay, okay, this person has called, I can call him back. Yes. And also I would want to tell you that in case you still uh, have issues connecting with Dr. De Silva, you can connect with us and we would be happy to, you know, take your queries forward to him as we are already uh, there in touch with him. So you can call us at this number or, you know, you can mail us your concerns here and we can take it forward to them in case, you know, you want to take that route as well. Okay, uh, so Dr. De Silva, uh, another thing that, do you think that there has to be a proper a uh, training which needs to be given to doctors how to take up telemedicine or yes, you know yes, yes because a lot of them are not aware about the yes. integrity and the legalities of it and uh, uh, most of them think that uh, just connecting either on a video and talking to the patient and taking and giving a prescription they need to know what is the uh, standard government recommended practice the telemedicine practice guideline based on that so that they are also see if they know the background of that and what to do, what not to do, they will be more safer. And uh, yes, definitely, it, like you said, your institute has got a module of training on, the, on telemedicine. Uh, you can also advise them. And it, it it's a basic, simple thing. 
but they need to get enlightened they should not just blindly jump into it because blindly jumping it can cause problem cause problem to the patient as well as to the doctor yes yes absolutely sir and uh, ravi kumar is asking how to improve or check on the online cases improve on the online cases i didn't get his question i think he wants to ask how to do that follow up maybe on the telemedicine the follow up again say as i said uh, when you have a initial uh, first consultation you give advice to the patient advice as far as what is his medical diagnosis what investigation he need to do and you prescribe some medicines and you give him a follow up date so when he comes back to you you review all the reports which he has got to you now you review his uh, physical condition and his whatever treatment have you given has it worked not worked has it got worse got better now based on that then you go further from there so basically it's not a one time thing you have uh, you get in touch with the patient first consultation then follow up consultation it keeps on repeating till the patient is satisfied that everything is okay with him and if you are a good doctor then the patient doesn't leave you when even if they get well they keep on following up with you <laughs> yes sir uh sangeeta is asking sir that is tele radiology beneficial to hospitals and diagnostic centers yes yes in a big way what happens is uh particularly to the tier 2 cities and smaller hospitals see they anybody can buy a, a mri or a ct scan or x ray and get things done you need only a technician to do things there so by and large that's what the model everywhere is that there is one doctor maybe in the department and uh, you just need a qualified radiologist to run a department uh, most of the big hospital they have they buy all the machines equipment everything now there are group of doctors who are just reporting like they are sitting at home they get reports from five four five centers daily basis they analyze it on their computer they give the report they need not uh, go to the department or to the hospital also so a uh, reporting of mri ct scan uh, ct angiographies uh, all those things are uh, available even the ultrasonographic images uh, the technician does it send it to the doctor the doctor reports it at his convenience that is home so uh, radiology as i said radiology and pathology are two department which uh, have benefited in a big way from uh, this uh, reporting pattern the pathologist sometimes may not go to his pathology lab at all for days together so everything that is done goes to him online he reports it reviews it and uh, gives the report thank you so much sir i think uh, you uh, took up all the queries which came uh, and uh, you know it was a very insightful and a very uh, good session and i'm sure and i'm glad that uh, many of the learners you know they could ask their uh, doubts and uh, i'm sure everybody got their answers so would like to thank you again sir for taking out time and uh, delivering this uh, talk for all of us thank i i enjoyed the interaction with the students uh, good good excellent thank you so much and thank you your team and yourself for uh, sparing your time and effort thank you thank you thank you dr thank you thank you, thank you, thank you sir thank you and thank you to everyone for joining in if you want any more details about the course uh, i have already shared the number and the link with you please do get in touch with us thank you so much have a good day